Just over 1,350 British servicemen have ever been awarded the Victoria Cross, but only one of them has ever been shot with a nail and trampled by a giraffe. An Essex boy who was one of those tough characters from 19th century Britain who seemed to have been cut from a different cloth compared to nowadays. This is the story of Sir Evelyn Wood, VC, the field marshal who rode on and was then trampled by a giraffe. Evelyn Wood was born near the town of Braintree in Essex in 1838. His father was an aristocratic clergyman. Despite the family's pedigree, the Woods were never particularly wealthy. And this lack of money would be a constant theme in Evelyn Wood's life. In April 1852, at the age of 14, he enlisted in the Royal Navy, serving on HMS Queen as a midshipman. When the Crimean War broke out in 1854, young Evelyn jumped at the chance to see action and joined the 1,400 strong naval brigade commanded by Captain William Peel, son of the former British Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel. The Naval Brigade played a key role in manning the siege guns at Sebastopol. Wood's ears would never recover from the roar of those guns, and as the years went by, he would become increasingly deaf. It was the first of a catalogue of injuries and illnesses that littered his career. Next up, he caught both dysentery and a fever and was confined to his bed. Despite this, Wood pulled himself out of bed to join the major British attack on the massive Russian fort called the Redan. The British advanced under heavy fire for over 250 yards of open ground and suffered 1,500 casualties before finally being forced to fall back. One of those casualties was midshipman Evelyn Wood, now aged 17. He and another sailor had carried a scaling ladder that normally required eight men to handle it, forward by themselves. Now, that's some feat for a 17-year-old suffering from dysentery. However, before reaching the fortification, his comrade was killed and young Evelyn was shot through the elbow. He managed to crawl to a field hospital. And here, he had to fend off a surgeon who decided that the best treatment was an amputation. Later, Wood used a mirror and a penknife to remove eight bone splinters from the wound. Whilst his commanding officer's recommendation that Wood be awarded the new Victoria Cross was turned down, he did receive the French Legion d'Honneur from Britain's ally. Invalided home, he now decided to join the army. However, this was in the age when officer commissions were still purchased. Even to join a lowly infantry regiment as an entry-level officer cost close to £500, something like £45,000 in today's money. As I mentioned earlier, the woods were gentry, but with little cash. Fortunately, Evelyn's conduct in the Crimea impressed the war office enough to offer him a commission without a purchase. He joined the 13th Light Dragoons. Once more, Evelyn was posted to the ongoing Crimean War, which was just what he wanted. But by the time he arrived, the Allies had captured Sebastopol, and by early 1856, a peace treaty had been signed in Paris. It's sometimes forgotten amidst all the Victorian battle paintings that disease was a far greater enemy in the Crimea than the Russians were. Of the roughly 20,000 British soldiers who died in that war, over 17,000 died of disease. With those sorts of statistics, you probably won't be surprised to learn that Evelyn Wood now caught both pneumonia and typhoid. He was evacuated to the British hospital at Scutari near Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. The hospital at Scutari had become famous as the base for Florence Nightingale. However, it's interesting to note that the public image of the caring Nightingale was not necessarily the experience of our young officer. For instance, during his time at Scutari, Wood was so emaciated that his hip bones protruded from his body. When his mother, Lady Wood, arrived at the hospital, having travelled from England because she was told her son was dying, she found a nurse striking him. If you think that these experiences in the Crimean War would have dampened Evelyn's enthusiasm for military service, you underestimate just how tough many of these Victorian officers and the rank-and-file soldiers were. In fact, he was so keen to see even more action, would even consider joining the French Foreign Legion so he could fight in Algeria. <laughs> but he needn't have worried. There was always a war of some sort going on in Queen Victoria's empire. Just a year after the Crimean War had ended, the Sepoy Rebellion in India began. Those of you who followed my episodes on the Sepoy Rebellion will know that the rising took the British authorities completely by surprise. Large parts of the Indian army rose against the British and they were joined by various hereditary rulers and others who wished to banish the British from the subcontinent. Consequently, as far as the British were concerned, 
It was all hands to the pump. Another opportunity for Evelyn Wood. The newly promoted Lieutenant Wood, a kindly uncle had purchased his promotion for him, transferred to the 17th Lancers, who'd recently participated in the charge of the Lights Brigade. By the time they'd arrived in India in May 1858, the main battles had been fought and the revolt had been broken. Nevertheless, large bands of mutineers and rebels still roamed the countryside, effectively operating as bandits. Wood was attached to a flying column in central India, tasked with bringing these bands to heel, and for hunting down rebel leader Tantia Topi. Topi has appeared in my episodes on the massacre at Kanpur and the story of India's Joan of Arc, the Rani of Jansi. In January 1859, Wood, commanding just 10 men, routed a force of 80 rebels. A few days later, he rescued a village headman who'd been abducted by more bandits and was about to be killed in the local jungle. For these two acts of bravery, Evelyn Wood was awarded Britain's highest Medal of Valour, the Victoria Cross. Despite managing to come through these encounters without a scratch, the injury-prone Wood was going to pick up some injuries in India. And some. Are you ready? First off, during a hunting trip, he managed to ride headlong into a tree. This was followed up on another hunt when he was attacked by a wounded tiger that injured his hand. But the absolute classic was when Wood was visiting a friendly Indian ruler. Evelyn accepted a bet to try and ride a pet giraffe. Well, when I say pet, I'm not sure wild animals are ever truly pets. But that didn't seem to worry Evelyn Wood, VC. He proceeded to mount the giraffe and rode it around the menagerie. However, he slipped off and the giraffe trampled him, breaking both of his cheekbones and crushing his nose. He would breathe with a wheezing noise for the rest of his life. Once more, he was invalided home. Now, let's pause and remember he was just 22. Wounded in action, dysentery, typhoid, fever, hearing ruined by artillery fire, ridden at full tilt into a tree, attacked by a tiger, trampled by a giraffe, all by the age of 22. Promoted to captain in 1861, he applied for a place at Staff College. However, at the time, the protocol was that only one person per regiment could attend the college for up-and-coming officers. It was Evelyn Wood's bad luck that another officer from the 17th Lancers had already been accepted. Rather than pass up on the opportunity, he decided to transfer from the cavalry to an infantry regiment, the 73rd Regiment of Foot, the Black Watch. The good news was that no one from the 73rd had been offered a place at Staff College. Thus, for 12 months from January 1863, Captain Evelyn Wood attended the college for officers who had the potential to be going places. It was a chance meeting at the War Office in London that was to help propel his career. For it was there that he met the talented and ambitious Garnet Wolseley. A fellow Crimean War veteran, Garnet Wolseley had been keeping a note of officers who impressed him. And you have to be honest, a Victoria Cross recipient, wounded in the Crimean War, who'd also survived being trampled by a giraffe, was someone pretty hard not to be impressed by. Wolseley took note. In 1874, Wolseley was given command of the British Army fighting the Kingdom of the Ashanti in modern-day Ghana. Now, it's easy to look at this war with 21st century eyes. An industrialised superpower versus a small African kingdom. There's no competition. But it wasn't seen as that easy at the time. The British presence on what was called the Gold Coast was limited to some forts on the coast itself. Between those forts in the Ashanti Kingdom lay impenetrable jungles, wide rivers and no highways. The climate and the tropical diseases of West Africa had given the region the nickname the White Man's Grave. And just for good measure, the Ashanti possessed the martial skills to make sure they were no walkover. In fact, they had bested small British armies in two previous conflicts. Wolseley had been given command of this tricky campaign precisely because he'd overcome challenging terrain during the Red River expedition in Canada. If anyone could do this, it was him. It was a golden opportunity for the aspiring officer to gain glory and climb towards the top of the British Army. A place, by the way, which he firmly believed he should occupy. On the flip side, if his expedition against the Ashanti went as badly as the previous two British efforts, his career would be going downhill instead. So it was imperative to Wolseley that he achieved a decisive victory, and to do so, he would leave nothing to chance. One of the ways that Wolseley determined to achieve success 
was to gather around him a group of talented officers whom he could trust to deliver victory. These men were to be called Wolseley's Ashanti Ring. Some of the most prominent names in the late Victorian British Army were there. Redvers Buller, Archibald Allison, John Carstairs McNeil, William Francis Butler, Hugh McColmont, John Morris and Evelyn Wood. Wood by now had purchased the rank of a major in the 19th Regiment, the Cameronians. It was one of the last purchases of rank in the British Army before the Cardwell reforms kicked in and it came at a heck of a cost, £2,000 in those days money which would equate to about £300,000 today. No wonder he always felt he was skint. When Wood got the summons from Wolseley, he had once more to use the expression, been in the wars. He arrived off the coast of Africa with a broken ankle and was drugged up to the eyeballs to alleviate the pain. Nevertheless, despite his injury, he cracked on recruiting a local regiment of Africans to support the British campaign. The Ashanti were armed with a variety of ageing firearms. With a little access to ammunition, they had adapted their guns to fire anything to hand. And it was during one battle that Wood was struck by one of these makeshift missiles. In his case, a metal nail, which entered his body just above his heart. The army surgeon took one look and announced there was no way he could operate to retrieve the nail. In fact, due to its position, he told Wood to prepare for the worst. But we're talking about a man who'd survived being trampled by a giraffe. Not only did Wood live, but he was to carry that nail inside his body for the next 50 years until he died. For his actions in the Ashanti War, Evelyn Wood was knighted. He was to return to Africa in 1878 with the 90th Regiment. He fought in the cause of war in South Africa and impressed the British commander, General Frederick Thesiger, better known as Lord Chelmsford. So impressed was Lord Chelmsford that when he invaded Zululand in January 1879, he placed Wood in command of Column No. 4, which included Wood's own 90th Regiment as well as the 13th Regiment of Foot. I've made several videos about the Anglo-Zulu War, so I'm not going to go into all the details now. However, I will post some links in the description below, so check them out. Suffice to say that Chelmsford made the fatal error of dividing number three column and the Zulus attacked the camp at Isandwana, wiping out the British garrison. The victorious Zulu army now regrouped and headed towards number four column. Sir Evelyn Wood tends to be remembered for the second of the two battles in which he faced the Zulu army. However, the first was almost another British disaster at the hands of the Zulus. Refusing to believe intelligence reports, Wood was almost surrounded at Klobani. He only just managed to get his force out in time, leaving over 200 of the 700-man force dead behind him. During the battle, Wood's own horse was shot from beneath him. The following day, 29th of March 1879, nearly 20,000 Zulus attacked Wood's main camp at Kambula. However, this time, Evelyn Wood had established a tight defensive position and inflicted a devastating defeat on the Zulus. It was the first major reversal for the Zulus in this war. I'm going to tell the stories of the battles of Holbani and Kambula in more detail in future episodes. With reinforcements, Chelmsford once more invaded Zululand later in 1879. Once again, Sir Evelyn Wood commanded Column No. 4, now renamed the Flying Column. By now, Wood's hearing was so poor that officers had to accompany him on his nightly rounds in case he didn't hear a challenge from a sentry. His column joined Chelmsford's and defeated the Zulu army once and for all at the Battle of Olundi. He returned to Britain as a Brigadier General. However, at Queen Victoria's request, he once more travelled to South Africa, this time accompanying the former Empress Eugenie of France. Her son, the Prince Imperial, had managed to get himself on a position accompanying Lord Chelmsford's second invasion. In a PR disaster, he was killed whilst on a scouting party. The exiled Empress now wanted to visit the spot where he had died, Queen Victoria herself commanded Brigadier General Sir Evelyn Wood VC to accompany the Empress. As a man of action, Wood was not at all impressed about having to act as a chaperone to an exiled European royal. He was even less impressed when, despite doing this job because Queen Victoria had ordered him to, he received no additional payment. He'd only just arrived back in Britain from that trip when he was once more ordered to South Africa. At least this time it was for a genuine military reason. The Boers in Transvaal had risen in rebellion against British rule. Evelyn Wood arrived in South Africa with reinforcements, but very shortly afterwards the British, under fellow Ashanti Ring officer General George Coley, suffered a humiliating defeat at the Battle of Majuba. Coley was killed in the battle 
and Wood now found himself in command of the British army facing the Boers. Whilst he was keen to take the offensive, the British government ordered him to negotiate a peace. The ensuing peace treaty recognised the Boers' independence. It was the first time since the American Revolution that part of the British Empire had ejected British rule. Wood was faced with a conundrum. As a professional soldier, should he carry out the orders of his government, even if he didn't particularly agree with them, or should he resign his commission in protest? He chose to sign the treaty. General Wolseley was outraged, calling it infamous, and Wood was also criticised by another Ashanti Ring member, General William Butler. Signing that peace treaty would put a strain on his relationship with Wolseley for the rest of his career. It didn't help that Wolseley also considered him a potential rival for the position of Commander-in-Chief of the British Army. Wood was popular with both Liberal Prime Minister William Gladstone and his Conservative rival Benjamin Disraeli. He was also popular with Queen Victoria, all of which put him in a position to grab the top job ahead of the ambitious Wolseley. Relations hadn't really improved by the time the Ashanti Ring next went into action in Egypt in 1882. Again, I've covered that war and the Battle of Tel El Kabir in a separate episode. With his faith in Sir Evelyn eroded and mindful that he could leapfrog him to the top job in the British Army, Wolseley left Wood, commanding the 4th Brigade in Alexandria, whilst he advanced on Cairo. Wood was the only member of the Ashanti Ring present in Egypt, not present at the Battle of Tel El Kabir. The glory of that victory was all at Sir Garnet. Nevertheless, in December 1882, Wood was appointed Sirdar or Commander-in-Chief of the Egyptian army. As Sirdar, Wood had hoped to command the expedition to rescue General Charles Gordon in Khartoum. But once again, Wolseley ensured that his rival was denied the limelight, taking command himself. He then appointed Wood to command the lines of communication, a very necessary role in any campaign, but not one that ever gains much glory. In the end, of course, the expedition failed to rescue Gordon and was wound up. It would be Wood's last foreign adventure. Returning to Britain, he was to hold a series of senior positions, including Quartermaster General and finally Adjutant General of the British Army. He became known as a military reformer, not so much in warfare planning and tactics as in the welfare of ordinary soldiers. He oversaw the rebuilding of army barracks to modern standards, well, modern by those days, which he insisted were named after British battles. He also introduced a programme of training army cooks, negotiated cheap rail tickets for soldiers going on leave, and introduced ecumenical services in the Irish regiments, which met with the approval of both Catholic and Protestant soldiers. Sir Evelyn never did get the top job in the British Army. However, in 1903 he was promoted to the rank of Field Marshal and retired the following year. In 1911 he was appointed Constable of the Tower of London, a post that he held until his death. In his later years he took up the newfangled leisure pursuit of bicycle riding, and in this capacity he was able to add one more injury to his litany of wounds and ailments. He rode into a horse which promptly bit him. Field Marshal Sir Evelyn Wood VC died near Harlow in Essex in December 1919. He was buried alongside his wife at Aldershot Military Cemetery. Shot twice, numerous riding accidents, bitten by a horse, attacked by a tiger, trampled by a giraffe, recipient of the Victoria Cross and the French Legion of Honour, Crimean War, Ashanti War, Khorza War, Zulu War, First Boer War, Egypt, Sudan. That is one heck of a life. With officers like that, no wonder Queen Victoria's British Empire ruled a quarter of the world. There's a pub named after Sir Evelyn Wood in Chelmsford in his home county of Essex. And after the life he led, I think he deserves a drink. Don't you? Well, thanks for joining me today. And if you'd like to dive deeper into some of the lesser known battles, campaigns, heroes from Britain's military history, then why not join my membership channel here on YouTube? You'll get extra exclusive videos going into greater detail and telling the lesser known stories. Click on the button which says join beneath this video to find out more. Thanks for your support, keep well, and I'll see you very soon.